Subtle skills, big results. Welcome to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Welcome everybody to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Garrett and Matt here with gold microphones for the both of us. Last time it was just me with the gold microphone because Garrett hadn't picked his up from the post office yet, but now he has it. It's installed. So hopefully the sound quality, now that my voice is better too, is music to your ears. We're on a different level now, Matt. Yeah, we're, we're like real podcasters now. The microphones have stepped us up a little bit. I really feel like we've gone to a different level. What's really fun is, Matt, not only, I mean, these these were a gift from Ninja Selling to us from Larry Kendall and uh, Rob Nelson. What's so much fun with the microphones is that they symbolize where this podcast has gone along the way is this journey that we've been on. And yeah, I remember uh, Larry saying you know, on the podcast, you know, when you hit 500,000 downloads or 500,000 records sold, you get a gold record. Matt, I want to celebrate also what this microphone represents is we just crossed 100,000 downloads in one month. And that is something that as I'm sitting here with a gold microphone talking with you, Matt, everybody listening out there, I am super excited about. So thank you, everybody who tunes in and listens. We're going through some mile markers here as we are continuing to grow and continuing to enjoy this. And I just want to say thank you. I have to echo that because super excited when I saw Sarah Garrett's wife had who really watches the stats, she sent us an email and said, 100,000 downloads. And I looked at that and I said, holy cow, that is awesome. I mean, you think about like when we started, it was like 100 downloads. That was cool. Now 100,000 in one month is amazing. So thank you, everybody, to all of you who are listening and sharing this around in your communities and your world and posting about it and being active in our Facebook community too, Garrett, because... I'm loving the pictures that people have been posting about where they listen to the podcast. That's been really enjoyable for me. Some are humorous, some are beautiful, some are like, hey, I'm, this is just where I am. I'm in the car commuting to work and I love it Also, I want to thank everybody for all of that. If you want to join our community, by the way, facebook.com slash groups slash The Ninja Selling Podcast, fastest growing community in the world. That's scientific fact now because I've said it enough times. It is. You say it enough. It is true. It just becomes true. Well, so Garrett, you brought up a great topic here, which is kind of an extension of this theme we've been on, which is kind of the the market narratives and some of the other things surrounding what's going on in the real estate market. But you brought up this topic of, of sub-markets or markets that are near each other that are not the same. You can see drastic differences moving you know, 10 minutes in one direction even. Well, it's interesting. so this topic, you know, a lot of the topics that we talk about, Matt, come from, you know, the people that I coach, I'll be working with them, I'll kind of, kind of get insights into their marketplaces. This topic actually comes from somebody who's one of our coaches, and we're having a deeper conversation about what we're seeing in our people that we coach. And he brought up this topic of sub markets of saying, like, we're really seeing some different patterns here start to show up in the world of extremes. So like we'll use Seattle here as a market because that's where he is at. Brian Harwood is the coach that brought this to my attention. So Brian, thank you so much. This was a great conversation we had yesterday. The piece that he had brought up and he wanted to share was that, you know, in Seattle and Seattle has been a market on fire for a long time. Like they have been as fast as you could put homes on the market. Lots of properties there. I'm hearing, you know, being bid way over asking price. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars over asking price crazy stuff going on. And he started to share that last year appreciation in a market called West Seattle, which is west of Seattle, <laughs> sorry, had about a 5% appreciation last year. Now, there's a couple factors that go into that. They've had some issues with their access to West Seattle. Their bridge went down a couple of years ago, which has changed some of their access. But all in all, it's a submarket of right there in Seattle. Now, the flip side of that is across the water, which is Lake Washington, you have Bellevue and the surrounding areas of Bellevue. They're running at like a 36% appreciation in the last 12 months. The fight for properties out there is insane. He shared a property that went on for 1.4, actually ended up closing for just over 2 million. Like these are insane battles for property that, that are going on. And the reason that this conversation came up, Matt, 
is he said, it's interesting to watch the flow of people where at first it was the fight for Seattle. Then they started fighting for the suburbs. And now they're realizing the suburbs are out of control and they're going, wow, we could actually have a better chance by going back into the city and seeing if we can maybe get a shot there at getting a home with less competition. It reminded me like pouring like water onto a pavement or watching a river that finds its way. Like all of a sudden there's a roadblock over here while the water turns and goes this way and finds a way over here. And I brought it up to you, Matt, because it was like, what a great time to talk about sub markets of your current market. And pretty much every market has sub markets. So Matt, I'll throw it back to you. Sorry, it was my, my monologue. No, I think that's great. When I become a uh, master plan developer, I'm going to flip flop north and south and east and west just to like mess with people when they're like, oh yeah, we live in uh, East Mattville. I'm like, oh, so that's on the east side. No, it's actually on the west. That would be amazing. Do you imagine like the power you would have to have to get that past planning? Oh my God. It would, yeah, that would be... <laughs> that, would be <laughs> that would be incredible. That would be funny. That would be a fun town to live in. That's for sure. So what I love about this, this idea of submarkets and how I think it, it really parlays onto what we were talking about market narratives and how we, we interpret certain things is like this gets really below kind of the surface level data that are all the assumptions that buyers and sellers make about marketplaces. And this is where a lot of the, well, that can't be comes out of when you see that one property, like how does that sell for that much? Or why isn't that property selling? Because the market is doing X, Y, and Z. I've seen this most most often happen over time in cities when you have block to block different condo buildings. And you see a condo building on the east side of the street selling at one dollar per square foot and a similar condo building on the west side of the street selling for much less per square foot or much more. And you start to look at that and you say, okay, well, what are the intrinsic value differences of those? I'll call them neighborhoods. They're just neighborhoods in the sky. I like to call them condos. They say, well, maybe there's a difference in amenities and maybe those amenities are more impactful right now. For example, during a time of COVID, I would think you know, condo sales were obviously a challenge in general, but the condo building that has more amenities with open air spaces, gyms, and other things in it is probably going to perform better and probably normally anyway, than a condo building that doesn't, but probably amplified during a time when, hey, I can't get to the public gyms or these other things. So if I could have one in the building I live in, that's going to be more powerful or work from home space in the building because condos notoriously don't have work from home spaces in the condo unless you have a penthouse, which would be sweet. But I have seen this in the past, Garrett, happen, but I'm also seeing it in my own neighborhood, right? My neighborhood... That has a different appreciation than a neighborhood just even across the road because of different amenities and things like that, which is making people go, well, what's really happening in the market? And I think these are things that realtors got to tune in on, Garrett. So like, does it make sense to pay attention to the specific data from each of these little submarkets, Or is it better to just have an open mind knowing that, hey, there are going to be differences and let's compare apples to apples as best we can? Well, I think first is opening your mind up and saying, okay, just because, you know, our office says this is the numbers for our entire area, like don't take that at face value and go and report that to everybody saying, this is what you're up against if you want to be a buyer, or you want to be a seller in our marketplace. I think you need to go do some more research. I think that luckily the research is readily available. It doesn't, you don't have to go too far to run some stats on a certain marketplace to get more educated on it. If it was me, you know, and I used to do this back when I sold, is that I had some specific data points that I always checked in on. And we've talked about this in the past, but absorption rates for me was one of my specific data points that I would check in on. And I took a day every single month, and I would sit down, it usually took me a couple of hours to sit down and run the data on different price points and different marketplaces. And you could see, like all of a sudden, it would like light up. $300,000 in this side of town over here is all of a sudden really starting to pick up and you'd watch it start to slow down on the other side of town. And I just broke my town into quadrants. But you know, again, our town was 30,000 people. It wasn't a massive city. The biggest thing is, Matt, and going back to that, I think you just need to pick some data points that you keep track of. Absorption rates are a good one because you can watch the trends happen fairly easily or how it's changing. That would be where I would go is just find a data point and check in on it regularly. And you can then see some of those changes start to happen. Like as Brian was saying, it's funny to watch where people are like 
all hot on this one marketplace out here. And I think condos is a really great example, Matt. You brought that into the equation. And you watch people that are like, no, 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 don't want condos right now. We're looking for the suburbs out here. And the suburbs blow up. There is going to be a point where people are going to go, well, I can't afford that suburb out there right now. What are my options? We can get a condo for how much per square foot right now? Like, maybe I can overlook some of these other little things and we can maybe take some less extra health precautions. And like, all of a sudden, condo sounds really good. And I think we're going to watch that flow come back in. I hate to quote Million Dollar Listing, the TV show. If any of you watch that, by the way, I like watching it. I find it extremely entertaining. But I was watching one episode and Josh Flagg, this is the LA version. He's a luxury broker out in LA. And he was talking to a buyer who was trying to understand like, well, why is this neighborhood like so much more expensive than over here? And his explanation was simply because everybody wants to be there. Let's keep it really simple. But that's a viable answer when you start getting down into these smaller sub markets if, of a larger market because to me, it's like, okay, demand is stronger there. So of course, prices are going to be higher. It doesn't matter that right across in the other zip code or whatever, or different post office, however you, you look at it, that the prices are that much less. And this is where I always turn back to, let's understand what our buyers' wants and needs and whys are, because that's going to help us tell a better story and help them find what works for them and also help understand where they're going. Because I know a lot of people, and we talked about this on one of the prior episodes, was worth repeating. A lot of agents are in the position where, well, I want to protect my buyers from spending too much right now because the market's getting so hot and I don't want them to come back at me if they need to sell that home in two years and I'm telling them they need to list it for below what they paid for it. One, scarcity mindset. Two, not your problem. <laughs> and I don't mean that as like a, have your buyers pay a lot of money. The point is, is we should find out what they want, why they want it and help guide them with good quality questions so that they understand what they're doing, not try to protect them or get them to do something because it's their decision at the end of the day. And looking at the absorption rate, I love that. And also just diving into the MLS and understanding individual neighborhoods a little bit more when you're working with these buyers can tell a bigger picture, Garrett. Well, if you've done a really good job, and we're talking about buyers specifically here for the moment, but if you've done a really good job with your 10-step buyers process, and I mean a really good job with your 10-step buyers process, and you know the marketplaces around you, sub-markets, what's going on, what's moving, what's appreciating, what's sitting stagnant right now, because you will find them all around you, you are an extremely powerful buyer's agent at that point in time. If you've done your research and you've done your homework with the actual people that you have in front of you, which allows you to then say, I hear what you're saying you want. We've done the what's and the why's. This is what you want. This is why you want it. And because this is why you want this stuff, let me take you outside of what you think you want. Like, let's go look at this marketplace over here that you would have never said, I want to go look at, but it fits all of your why's right now. Because they might be looking at it and saying, we don't want to spend that much money. And it, I love what you said, Matt, because people want to live there. Like, that's why the prices are higher. Like, it's desirable. It could be as easy as that, which also makes me think, Garrett, submarkets don't just have to be location. They can be features or benefits. For example, having a detached office space from the house could be a submarket, maybe a small submarket, but that's actually a submarket that I fall into. Having an office space that's detached from the main house is very important so that we can do things like this without dogs or children in the background. Because if you remember in the early days of the podcast, Victoria often made an appearance on the podcast because the office was in the house. And so when you look at that, that was a big criteria for how we went about our home search, which was quite short because that submarket is very small where we live to find, hey, where can we get another house that has a detached space as well when we want to have some more space? That could be a submarket. Uh, submarkets could include lot sizes, which maybe a neighborhood is typically quarter acre lots, but there's a handful of half acre lots in that neighborhood. And when one pops up, that submarket of buyers who want that extra space all of a sudden appears. And so, you know, Garrett, I think that's something important to think about too when we're working with sellers and buyers is how do those types of things impact the market value? I'll, I'll give, an, and I know I'm kind of rambling here, but I'll give an example. We have two houses in our neighborhood that are currently under contract. They're side by side. 
One of the houses is a little bit bigger with basically double the lot size. And the other house is a very, very nice house, but obviously half the lot size and a smaller house. We're talking about over a $100,000 difference in price and a lot of days on market difference. The more expensive home on the market for maybe two days, the less expensive home on the market for, I, I got to look at the days now, is probably about a good month before it went under contract, several price reductions. What's trending higher? Is it lot size or is it nicer house? What, which one is are people finding more desirable right now? I'm going to, and it'll be interesting to see what these close at, but I'm going to go with that lot size because I would say the quality of the homes are very, very similar. It was the size of the home on the bigger lot. It was definitely a bigger size. So all attributed to size of the house and the lot size. Family friendly, maybe that's part of it. You know, more space for kids and things like that versus the other house is really suitable for younger families. And actually, the similar model home as ours, as I'm looking at that, I'm like, oh, my home's on the smaller side of that. But man, you think about it like as times change, 2019, it very might have actually been that the nicer house on the smaller lot may have sold for more. It'll be really interesting to see what those numbers come out to be. And, th- and this is where understanding your marketplace and understanding the submarkets and understanding the little nuances in an, in an area like that, where you might have larger lots or smaller lots with nicer homes, whatever it might be, is that if you can figure out those little differences, you can guide your people so much better and you can be super educated about what's going on. And I'll pay for education. I'll tell you that. If I can have an agent that's working in my corner that is highly educated, I'll take that all day long as we're out there going to battle trying to find a house. Yeah. And I think, Garrett, a lot of that education comes in knowing the right questions to ask and asking the right questions so that you know what to search for. And then even on the listing side, so you know, hey, how can we approach this listing strategy and where are we going to price this out at to attract the right buyer pool as well. So you have to ask a lot of questions around all of it because the submarket in knowing it from the buyer perspective is just as important from the list side as well, Garrett, because knowing that current buyer pool, right? During this time where we know that people are valuing outdoor space very, very high right now, where we know that they're valuing home offices very, very high right now. If you have a seller that doesn't have those features, then we have to have a conversation and say, hey, what type of buyer pool? What is the submarket of the buyer pool that is currently really active right now that we might be missing out on because we don't have those things? Can we get that inputted into the property? Or are there other things that we can highlight to make up for it to bring the value back up? Well, you think about as a listing agent, if you're up against or competing against other brokers for a listing and you have that moment where you're like, that's insane that they think that they can sell it for that much. And you had that moment of like, oh, they bought the listing or whatever. That also might be an agent that has figured out where value is sitting right now in the marketplace that maybe you don't see yet, or maybe you see value that the others aren't seeing. And you're like, you know what? We can go and push this a little bit because this is a desired property for all these reasons right now. We're watching this trend. I think a lot of this comes also, Matt, to I think a lot of people figure this out because they're doing lots of listings. Like a a lot of good listing agents are not great listing agents right now because they're doing the research. They're having to do the research. Like they're accidentally doing the research because they're listing all these properties and in it every day. If you want to be a good listing agent, this is what you need to do because you don't have all the listings. You're not doing this every day to go do the research. And which means you have to do the research prior, do it now so that you can show up as that expert, which then you can start building your listing inventory. And speaking of that, Matt, great listings out there right now. I have people that have crazy listing inventories as real estate agents right now coming into the beginning of February. For all the people that are going like, man, I wish I had a listing. They're out there. They are coming on. Yeah. I think we're getting past that pause we talked about. And I think the the pace is... I mean, I know here locally where I am, contracts are the same pace as they were last year. So... I got my seatbelt buckled, even though I don't have to actively participate in it at the moment, just because I want to enjoy the ride. It's going to be fun to watch. It's one of those that's going to be happening again this year, Garrett. So that's for sure. It's funny, Matt. We're not like in the driver's seat handling that, but we are definitely in the passenger seat of about 40 different markets. More than that, Matt, when you take all of your marketplaces and add them into my marketplaces that I worked in. And it is an interesting roller coaster to watch when you talk to different people and 
sometimes even in the same market that are just having a totally different viewpoint on what's going on in this world right now. And it's like, this is not a market thing. Like you need to take a step back and engage the marketplace because again, the business is there that that pause that we had mentioned for a little bit of like, kind of like what's going to happen here. I am watching that lift on every market that I thought that that was in, but going back to it, we are seeing offices where the divide of people that are figuring out the market and the divide of people that are sitting around going like, oh my gosh, what's going on? That is starting to part. The sea is starting to part. And it's going to be interesting. I'm curious to see what that's going to look like. Not the market though. Don't blame the market, everybody. Don't do it. And please don't blame interest rates. I had somebody bring up to me the other day that interest rates were affecting the slowdown. I'm like, what, the quarter point or the eighth of a point? No, no, no. I'm not in. I'm not buying that one either, Garrett. You know, honestly, I'm not buying any of the headlines about real estate right now. I am definitely bullish on real estate in general, as I think everybody should be. But all of the bear associated headlines, for those of you who like to talk stock market lingo, bulls and bears, I'm not buying any of it. No way. All right. So Garrett, any other points about the sub markets that you want to hit on here? No, no, no. And I think just to kind of wrap the point here, I just want to say is that whatever you're given marketplaces, especially the larger the marketplace is, don't assume that there's a blanket, this is what our marketplace is doing. And don't push that lingo or that story on your clients. I think it's really important to open it up and say, look, there are marketplaces right now that are really hot. There are ones that that we're going to have to really step up to the plate and be super aggressive if we're going to help you get a home. But there also are some, again, these sub markets that we might have a better shot in and put it on the table for people. Let them know because they might surprise you. They might say, you know what? We tried a couple of times over in that neighborhood. Our More of our concern is making sure that we have a home for our kids to start school in, for family, whatever's going on. So pay attention to your submarkets. You know, you brought that up. I'll just highlight, go back and listen to our podcast we did with Larry Kendall, because we talked a little bit about the school districts and things. I think those are going to become, they already are submarkets, and I think those are going to continue to be strong submarkets in either direction, depending on what the demand is for certain policies and things in those areas. So watch the school districts for sure. I think you're going to see interesting things with that. Yep. Well, man, I'm good. Cool. Well, awesome. Thank you, Garrett, for bringing this awesome topic. And thank you, everybody, again, for tuning in and and onto our inaugural dual gold microphone podcast here. Hopefully, we are going to deliver on the audio quality for you so that your your ears feel good when you listen to this. Well, everybody, I appreciate you so much for joining in. As always, go check us out in the uh, Facebook Ninja Selling Podcast community, the Ninja Selling Podcast community in groups. And if you want to know more about installations coming up, go check out ninjaselling.com. You can find out all the public installations that are being offered out there. They are putting more and more on the books every day so that all of you can get to an installation if you want to go. If you want to know more about coaching, come check us out. You can go to ninjaselling.com or you can go to ninjacoaching.com and learn more about us and what we're doing and how we can help you with your business. So thank you so much. Appreciate everybody. Matt, have a great day. You too. And thank you, everybody. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like more, visit us at the ninjasellingpodcast.com. There you will also find links for more information about ninja selling and coaching. Have an incredible day.